Good morning. So I like the masks. I can't see you yawn when I'm preaching. So we're going to be studying Second Peter this morning. And uh, I understand the ladies Bible study, they studied this in the spring for a couple of months. So um, I have a request. Please be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, if I were to title this message, if I were to title this message, I would title it, and I guess I am titling it, Press On to Christian Maturity. Press On to Christian Maturity. Before we get started and before I lose you, I'd like to tell you what it is, and I'm going to be trying to say in this sermon this morning, the main points of the sermon. So I've got 13 points. Probably not a great idea. I heard that uh, sermons are supposed to be three points in a prayer. I've got 13 of them. So the first point, Peter has great authority within the church given to him by God and recognized by the early church. Point two, there is one body of believers. There's not a division in the body of Christ based on authority. Point three, the basis of the Christian faith is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The basis of the Christian faith is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Point four, God has given every believer, every believer everything he or she needs to live a life that pleases him, including making them partakers of the divine nature. That is, giving them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Point five, faith is the beginning of the Christian life, not the end. It's the beginning of the Christian life, not the end. Point six, we are to add to our faith, always pressing forward to Christian maturity. Point seven, love is the crowning characteristic of a mature Christian. Point eight, if we pursue maturity, we will be honored by God when we enter heaven. Point nine, there will be people who come into the church teaching error, appealing to the lust of your flesh. Be vigilant. Don't be misled. Point ten, Jesus Christ is coming back to earth one day. It's a fact. It is a fact. When 11, God's heart, God's desire is to save people from judgment. Point 12, on the day of the Lord, sin will be judged severely and the heavens and the earth will be destroyed. Let that motivate us to live righteously in the present day. There we go. God will one day create new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Let that also motivate us to live holy lives. Get started now. So this is what I'll be trying to say in the next half hour or so. And this is what Peter talks about in his book. Before we get into the text, I'd like us to think for a moment about who Peter was. He is no small figure in the early church. There's no small figure in the early church. I spoke on Matthew 16 a year or two ago, and I took some time to comment on the statement by the Lord Jesus, where he said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And Jesus is making a statement in response to Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And one of the points I made in that sermon was that Jesus was referring to Peter's declaration, not Peter himself when he said that he would build his church on this rock. This rock was not Peter himself, and I still believe that. But that does not minimize the role that Peter played in the formation of the early church. Peter was not the rock or the foundation of the church. The foundation of the church is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? But Peter was the chief pillar in the early church. And so when he speaks or writes, as he did in his letters of First and Second Peter, he writes as one with great ecclesiastical authority, 
as given to him by God and as recognized by the early church. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, I think when people would get a letter from Peter, I think they, they looked at it with great reverence. You know, Peter was a big deal. And so as we read 2 Peter, <clears throat> please remember who it is that's speaking. 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're just going to kind of go through this <clears throat> verse by verse. <clears throat> Peter, this great follower of Jesus Christ, this great pillar in the church, begins his letter and he says, Simon Peter, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And we could skim over these greetings, but I think in this case, and in many others throughout the New Testament, Peter and some of the other writers start out with this line, that they are bondservants or slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even James and Jude, we heard about them last week, they're half-brothers of the Lord. Even they start their letter in this fashion, that they are servants of Jesus Christ. So Peter, right from the start, declares his submission to Jesus Christ. But he also identifies himself here as an apostle of Jesus Christ, right from the start. Why is that? I think he does that to declare his authority in the church. He's not just another disciple. He's not just another follower of Jesus. He is an apostle, one of the 12 of Jesus Christ's most intimate disciples, one who has been given authority in the church, authority to teach, authority to command, authority to discipline. So Peter declares his submission to Christ and also his authority over the church in this very first sentence. Next, Peter, this great apostle, declares his oneness with the people that he's writing to. If anyone had reason in the church to lord it over the flock, it was Peter, right? Peter's Jesus' right-hand man, the chief apostle. But here he says he's writing to those of like precious faith. Like precious faith. He declares his relationship to those he's writing to. He says, we are one in this faith in Jesus that we both obtained. He says they have obtained like precious faith with us. Presumably that's the rest of the apostles. We are all in this one body of believers. I think that's what Peter is saying here. And I think this is an important point. There's not two levels of saints in the church, right? There's not the Peters and Pauls over here and the rest of us huddled in some corner of the kingdom over here, right? But we have made a distinction over the centuries between saints, we in the church, I should say, generally speaking. We've had this division in the church between clergy and laity. And somehow clergy are on some exalted level compared to the rest of us. But Peter, this great apostle, maybe the greatest of the apostles, includes these believers he's writing to as being of the same faith, in that one body with him on an equal basis. The Apostle Paul said, we're all baptized by one spirit into one body. There's an equality. Okay, and that's what we believe here at this church, or I wouldn't be up here speaking. Right? I'm not ordained to speak. We believe in this church in the gifting of the Holy Spirit. Peter then goes on to state the basis of their common faith. He says that this faith that they all have obtained, Peter included, is by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to note that title of the Lord Jesus. Peter calls him our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But the basis of their faith, the basis of our faith, is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Peter didn't have any righteousness to bring to the table. I think that's part of what he's saying here. The basis of their faith is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Christ. The active ingredient in their faith is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the working agent of their faith is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, Peter is restating the obvious to these believers, I think. I'm I think they knew it. I'm sure they knew it. 
but he is reminding them. He's reminding them that the basis of our faith is the Lord Jesus. In verses 2 to 4, Peter writes, he says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Then he goes on in verse 3 to say, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now Peter says that as believers in Jesus Christ, God has given them everything that they need, everything that we need, to lead a life of godliness and virtue. He talks about being partakers of the divine nature. What does that mean? That seems like a great leap, right? From saved sinners to partakers of the divine nature. But the Bible declares that when we, when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ, when we receive the Lord Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive God himself into our bodies. We take on the divine nature. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's what the Apostle Paul said. So Peter says that we believers are equipped to live a life that honors God. We have everything that we need, including the Holy Spirit himself. So brothers and sisters, there's no excuses. Amen? There's no excuses. In verse 5, Peter is going to exhort these believers in writing to live their lives in a way that reflects their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Now, I want to make a point here. And I've said this before when I spoke, but I think it bears repeating. Thank you. I think it bears repeating. I think a lot of times in the church, particularly in the American Protestant church, that there's been such an emphasis on faith and on salvation that I think a lot of us think that saving faith is the end game. That once I'm saved, I'm good. There's nothing else for me to do. I was lost. Now I'm found. I've completed the mission. And now I'm going to go live my life. I'm going to stop in church every once in a while, maybe even every Sunday. But I'm going to live my life like every other American. But Peter here says, add to your faith. Add to your faith. Faith is not the end. Faith is not the end. It is the beginning. It is the beginning. And Peter says, add to your faith virtue. What is virtue? Virtue is goodness, holiness, righteousness, right living. And then he says, add to virtue knowledge. Now, Peter isn't talking about general knowledge, right? He's not talking about calculus or history or philosophy. He's talking about knowledge of God and his word, right? Knowledge of God and his word. So he says, add to your faith virtue, add to your virtue knowledge, and then he says, add to your knowledge self-control. Add to your knowledge self-control. And I can't help but think of that list of the fruits of the Spirit in the book of Galatians, right? Two of the fruits of the Spirit are Goodness or virtue and self-control. And love is also listed in that, in that uh, passage in Galatians, which Peter is going to mention as well. So these things that Peter is encouraging us to do as believers in Jesus Christ are provided by the Holy Spirit. So in order to do these things, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Right? And self-control means controlling my appetites, my speech, my body, bringing myself into submission to Jesus Christ. And then he says, add to your self-control perseverance. Perseverance means that we are faithful to the Lord Jesus through thick and through thin, through blessings, through trials, until the very ends of our lives here on earth, right? And then Peter says, add to perseverance, godliness. Godly living or godliness is only possible because we have God in the person of the Holy Spirit living within us. As I thought about this progression that Peter has laid out here, I thought about the fact that godliness will be the end result of our perseverance, right? 
There's coming a day when we will be removed from the presence of sin. We talked about that this morning. The presence of sin out there, but the presence of sin in here. We're going to be removed from that. That's the day I'm looking forward to. I don't have to take myself to heaven with me, right? It says in the Bible that when we see the Lord Jesus, that we will be like him. We will be like him. On that day, we will truly be godly. In that, in that sense, we're going to be pure. We're going to be sinless. Peter goes on to say, to add to our godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Who would have thought that there would be something to add to godliness, right? But Peter doesn't leave godliness as the last thing on his list. Peter encourages these believers to not stop at faith, but to keep going and to add to that faith. And here he says to add brotherly kindness to your faith. So I had to ask myself a question. Am I concerned about other people's welfare? I should be. I should be. We're living in a time right now where people are feeling marginalized. Our country is in a great struggle. And it's a very complicated issue, and I don't want to oversimplify the issues. But I watched on TV as an unarmed black man got shot in the back while running away from a white police officer. And there are other similar type incidents. Many people, black and white alike, are demanding justice and rightfully so. Do we care? I think brotherly kindness demands that we do and that we should do what we can to bring about justice where we know someone's been wrong. I don't know what form that would take for you. But if we want peace, we need to work for justice, right? Well, Peter here says, add to your faith brotherly kindness. Add your faith, brotherly kindness. And finally, the crowning thing in this list that Peter has laid out is love. Love. The final thing is love. The two greatest commandments, Jesus said, are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And what's the second one? To love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. If we want to reach the pinnacle of Christian maturity then we have to strive to love God first and then to love our neighbors as ourselves. I was thinking about the reactions to the current crisis in our country. As a result of this social unrest that's going on, all kinds of legislation is being proposed or passed to address these problems. Kind of a knee-jerk reaction. Mayors, governors, congressmen are all working like crazy, trying to push through laws right now to address this crisis. Laws designed to compel people to do the right thing. But laws are a poor substitute for love. Laws are a poor substitute for love. And don't misunderstand me. Laws are necessary, but only because we as a society don't keep the two greatest commandments, right? The Apostle Paul wrote the same thing in Romans 13, 8 through 10. He wrote, let no date debt remain outstanding except the debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law in verse 9 he wrote that all the commandments and how we treat each other like don't commit adultery don't steal don't lie etc are summed up in this one commandment love your neighbor as yourself so peter writes add to your brotherly kindness love I was reminded of Paul's description of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In Paul's description, he says, I can do all these wonderful things. I can speak with the tongues of men and angels. I can, my, I can give my body to be burned. I can do all these godly things. But if I don't have love, it means nothing. He goes on to say that the three greatest things are faith, hope, and love. But he says the greatest of these is love. Faith is going to end in sight, right? Hope is going to end in reality. But love is never going to end. Love is eternal. When we get to heaven, it won't require any more faith on our part. It's not going to require any more hope on our part. But heaven is filled with the love of God. 
Love is supreme, and I believe that's what Peter is saying here. It is the final thing. It is the crowning achievement, the crowning characteristic of a mature Christian. All right, let me see here. There we go. In verses 8 and 9, Peter says, If you do these things, if these attributes are your, yours, that you will be a fruitful Christian. But he says, if you lack these things, you're blind and you've forgotten that you were cleansed from your sins by the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said it this way. He said, don't you know, don't you know that you're not your own? That you were bought with a price? What was that price? The precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't forget that. Press on to Christian maturity. In verse 10, Peter writes, Be diligent to make your call and election sure. What is he saying? He's saying live what you claim to believe. Live what you claim to believe. Walk the talk. You say you believe in Jesus Christ. Live like it. You've been saved. Live like it. In verse 11, Peter writes, For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Another translation says, And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of Christ. If you live for the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be rewarded. You will be welcomed into heaven. You'll be honored by God. You want to be honored by God? Live for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you continue to grow in your faith. Right? That's a big if. We have to continue to grow in our faith. I'm reminded of those verses where the Apostle Paul wrote regarding the judgment seat of Christ, where every believer is going to appear for their works to be judged. This is not a judgment of salvation. It's a judgment of works. What did you do? with this new life I gave you. Paul wrote that some are going to bring wood, hay, and stubble. That means they did other things rather than serve the Lord. Even religious things that were self-serving. And he says those things are going to be burned up. But other believers are going to bring gold and precious stones. Costly things. Right? Things that cost them. Are you doing things that cost you? For the Lord Jesus Christ. And these people are going to bring these things before the Lord. And the the Lord is going to reward them accordingly. So live your life knowing that your Savior, the Lord Jesus, is watching. And he is anxious to reward you for your faithful service. Peter writes in verses 12 through 15 that he is not going to forget to remind these believers of these things, even though they know them. And he says, I'm going to make sure that you always have a reminder of these things, even after he has passed away. He knows his time on earth is short, and he wants to ensure that they know these things. And 2,000 years later, he's still reminding us. We know this stuff that we're talking about this morning. This, this, isn't, this is Sunday school stuff, right? We sang in Sunday school, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, 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 right? We know this stuff, and we know that we're supposed to add to our faith, that we're supposed to live for the Lord, that we're supposed to be good people, that we're supposed to be in God's Word, and that we're supposed to persevere and be faithful to the end of our lives. This isn't anything new that I'm preaching here this morning. But that doesn't mean that we're not to be reminded. We need to be reminded. We need to be exhorted to keep on keeping on for the Lord. Right? Amen? In verses 16 to 18, Peter writes about the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That had happened. He said, when we told you about these things, we were not talking about fairy tales. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
Peter writes about that day when he and James and John were on a mountain with the Lord Jesus and they saw him in all of his glory. I think it was John who wrote that when they looked at his face, it was like looking into the sun. The brilliance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they heard a voice, the voice of the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. In verses 19 through 21, Peter writes that this prophecy concerning the arrival of the Messiah, this prophecy in the scriptures, was fulfilled. And he stresses the reliability of the scriptures. He writes that man didn't make this stuff up, but that men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they wrote those things down. Men didn't predict these things themselves, but they wrote as they were moved by the Spirit of God. The scriptures are reliable. The Bible is reliable. Hence why we study it, right? Now we move to chapter 2. Now, unfortunately, in the interest of time, I had to shorten this message. So chapter 2 took the brunt of that, but I'm going to do my best to summarize it. In chapter 2, and this is chapter 2, verse 1, in chapter 2, Peter is going to change course a little bit, and he's going to warn his readers about false teachers who come into the church, and they attempt to lead people away from the truth. And he says they're going to come in, and they're going to appeal to them on the basis of the flesh. He uses words like covetousness, greed, lewdness, adultery, and similar things to describe them. He's not pulling any punches. He says... They are like unreasoning animals in one, in one verse. In verse 19, he writes, They promise freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. They will even deny the Lord Jesus who bought them, he writes. And he makes the point repeatedly that they will be condemned and they will be judged severely by God. So what he's saying is that we need to be vigilant and we, we need to not be deceived by these men. And he's going to touch on this again, which we're going to get to in chapter 3. So that's the brief synopsis of chapter 2. Okay, in chapter 3, Peter pivots again, and, and he's going to warn his readers that other people are going to come and they're going to ridicule their faith. So he says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. What is he saying? And I think we face this in the world we live in. I think we face this any time that we witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe in Jesus Christ, a man who was crucified 2,000 years ago. He promised he was coming back, and yet we are still waiting. And I think the world sees this as foolish, right? As ignorant. But Peter has an answer for him. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, Peter writes, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. First thing Peter writes is that God is not on our timetable. He doesn't measure time like we do. For us, a thousand years is a really long time. For God, Peter writes, this is like a day. Okay, he could have written one second. God is eternal. God is eternal. Our lives on this earth may be at best 100 years. We don't have the same perspective that God has. Secondly, Peter says there's another reason for his delay. Peter writes that the reason the Lord Jesus is not back yet is that God is long-suffering toward mankind. And that he is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repent. 
I think in this verse, verse 9, and I've got to share this with you. So I was nervous about preaching. I opened up my tablet this morning to read my Bible Gateway verse of the day, 2 Peter 3, 9. I think in this verse, verse 9, we get a glimpse of the heart of God. God's desire is that men and women and boys and girls would repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not saved this morning, God desires you to be saved. What Peter wrote in this letter is that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not willing. But unfortunately, the hearts of people are willing to be lost, to turn away from the grace and the love of God. Here's another verse, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3-6. through 6. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Even though God desires everyone to be saved, everyone will not be saved. And we see this will of God versus will of man struggle throughout the scriptures. You think about it, Israel, God's people know the truth. They know what God desires. God sent them prophets, right, to tell them what he desired. There's no mystery. Yet they continually exercise their own will and they rebel against God's will. God's will, God's desire is that they listen and obey, yet over and over and over again. They do what they want to do. In Matthew 23, 37, I think we see this in perfect clarity. Jesus said this, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You were not willing. Jesus is speaking here, but he's not speaking so much as Jesus of Nazareth, the man. When he says, how often I wanted, he's speaking as the son of God. Indeed, God himself. He says, I wanted to gather you, but you were not willing. Breaks the heart of God, I think. Jesus is speaking here, I'm sorry, so in our text, we see the reason for Christ's delay in his return. His heart, his desire, his will is that no one perishes, and that all would come to repentance. And so he waits with long-suffering patience, waiting for people to repent and to come to faith in him. Again, all people will not be willing to be saved. People who are lost will have to run over the love and the grace of God in order to be lost. His desire, his will, his heart is that they would be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Peter now talks about what's going to happen when God's long-suffering and patience are exhausted and Jesus Christ returns to judge the world. Now, I don't, I no expert on the end times. I don't know when this is going to happen. What I read, it sounds like this day is going to happen at the end of the millennium. When the Lord Jesus reigns on earth a thousand years, then this event is going to happen, the day of the Lord. So here Peter talks about that, and he describes this event for us. For all, first of all, he says that this day will come suddenly and unexpectedly. In his words, in verse 10, he says that the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night, suddenly and unexpectedly. He says that it's going to be accompanied by great catastrophic events. The heavens are going to pass away with a great noise. The elements are going to melt with fervent heat. The earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. When he comes, the earth and everyone and everything in it is going to be destroyed. 
Verse 11 then is a pivotal verse. We talked about the idea of the therefore this morning in breaking of bread. You see a therefore, it's always referring to what was just stated. So it's a pivotal verse. Peter writes, therefore, since all these things are going to be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? It's back on that same message from chapter 1. Add to your faith. Live righteously. Press on to Christian maturity. But here he gives them an additional reason to live holy lives, and that is the judgment of God on sin. And in verse 12, it says, remembering that and looking, envisioning that day when he does the judging. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying our salvation is in jeopardy, but knowing that God hates sin to the point where he will destroy the world with fire, that we should live holy, righteous lives. We see how God, how God feels about sin. This awesome judgment that's coming on the earth. In verse 13, Peter writes that we are to be, according to God's promise in the Holy Scriptures, looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So on the day of the Lord, this earth is going to be destroyed by God. And one day, I don't know how soon after the destruction of the old earth, but he's going to create a new earth with new heavens where righteousness dwells. Sin has been dealt with. The old earth and its curse and, its, and sin has been destroyed and done away with. And so now on this new earth, righteousness is going to be the norm. Right? You know, since we've been dealing with the uh, COVID-19 virus, I keep hearing this phrase, the new normal, meaning that now we have to practice social distancing and wear face masks and keep washing our hands, right? I think we're all sick of it. But on this new earth, there's going to be a new normal. It's not going to be washing our hands. Sin's going to be gone, and righteousness is going to be the new normal. And loving one another, like we talked about earlier, it's not going to be a problem at all. It's not going to be a problem. <clears throat> In verse 14, Peter is back to his theme of right living. He writes, Beloved, looking forward to these things, this looking ahead to where this, when this new earth and new heavens, where righteousness is going to dwell, be diligent to be found by him without spot and blameless. There's a new earth coming where righteousness will be the norm. Get a head start on it. Get a head start on it. Start living righteously right now. Right now. Peter is going to, in verses 15 and 16, talk about the Apostle Paul and his writing, which Peter says, Peter says, his epistles in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction. What things is Peter referring to? If you think about Paul's writings, what are the things that stand out? When I think about the Pauline epistles, Paul writes about a lot of things, but there are some themes that he keeps repeating. Justification by faith alone. The inadequacy of works to make anyone righteous and Christian liberty. Right? So I think Peter, when he says untaught and unstable people, he's talking again about those false teachers who he described in chapter 2. What is their message? What is their message? Their message is basically giving permission to people to sow to the flesh, to live immorally, and maybe taking Paul's writings to the extreme, using them as justification for immorality. Hey, you're justified by faith. Works are done away with. You can live any way you like. You have liberty in the Lord. A gross perversion of Paul's teachings. But unfortunately, we still see it today. Because it appeals to our basest instincts. 
Paul recognized it in himself in Romans 7 when he wrote, For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. We talked about that at the breaking of bread service. This message appeals to that old man that is and will be present with me until, I, until the day that I go to be with the Lord. Amen? Peter goes on in verse 17 in the NIV. He says, Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless. He's saying this message is out there. Be vigilant to see it and, and <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and guard yourself from its temptation so that you're not deceived. <clears throat> guard yourself from this temptation so that you're not deceived. In verse 18, he's back on his theme. And he writes, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just like he said earlier, add to your faith. Be diligent to be found spotless and blameless. And now he says, grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. What's he saying? Press on to Christian maturity. Press on to Christian maturity. And I've been a Christian for, I don't know, what's this? Since 1982. I don't know how long that is. 38, thank you. I can't stop pressing on to Christian maturity. Time has nothing to do with it. Press on to Christian maturity. Press on to Christian maturity. Press on to Christian maturity. Grow. Grow. Don't remain a seedling. Don't stop the day you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Peter says that's not the end. That's the beginning. It is the beginning. Now grow. Add to your faith virtue and knowledge and self-control and godliness and perseverance and brotherly kindness and finally love. And while you're growing, watch out for those who are going to try and sway you from what you know to be right. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Resist the temptation of immorality and greed and the appeals to your flesh. Remember that the Lord's going to return and he is going to judge sin severely. So much so that this earth is going to be destroyed by fire. So stay on the right side. Be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Paul wrote, right? And you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, right? Remember also that God is going to create a new earth where he is ruling and righteousness is going to dwell there. It's going to be the new normal, right? It's going to be the new normal. So let's, let that motivate you to live righteously right now. Peter closes with this sentence. He says, to him, that's the Lord Jesus, be glory both now and forever. Amen. Peter starts out in this letter by praising the Lord Jesus for his righteousness. That is the basis of our faith. Amen. Without the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we are lost, period. And Peter praises him also for giving us all the things that we need to live a righteous life, by whom we have all the promises of God and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he opens with the praise of the Lord Jesus Christ and he closes the same way. And that's what we're going to do right now. To him, to him, that's Jesus. To him be both glory now and forever and forever and forever. And forever. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We confess that we would be absolutely lost without him. Help us, Lord, to press on to Christian maturity. To keep pressing on. To not think somehow we've arrived at some destination. We need to keep pressing and keep pressing. Help us to do that, Lord. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for all the gifts that you've given us in him. Help us to be filled with him so we can exhibit those fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, self-control. All those things, goodness. 
Thank you, Lord, also that we can all be together again. And uh, I'm looking forward to the day when we can be together like we used to be. And I'm also looking forward to the day when we're with you, all of us are with you. We'll really have some fellowship then. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done for us. We ask you to bless us as we leave. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen.